630. Um, so thank you all for joining us and welcome. We are using Zoom webinars tonight, so we do apologize if anyone had trouble accessing the presentation last week. Um, please bear with us while we navigate using this new Zoom feature. Um, we will go over some details when we get started. Um, but until then, you should be able to see me and hear me. So if you cannot, please let me know in the chat. Um, thanks for that. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Northern Kentucky History Hour. I'm your host for tonight, Heather Cook. I work as a Visitor Service Associate at BCM, and I am joining you live from my home in Cincinnati. Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of the Bandra Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum. We'd like to thank all of our sponsors. Barringer Crawford Museum is supported in part by the City of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph V. Hale Jr. U.S. Bank Foundation, and our members. If you're not yet a member of the museum, please consider joining for access to discounts and exclusive programming. You can learn more and join at bcmuseum.org. Um, you will join our fantastic community of members and staff at the museum um, and have access to the museum and all the great programs we have there. So we really do hope you consider joining us. Um, before we begin, let's go over a few reminders. If you have a question or comment to share, please type it in the chat or the Q&A feature, and we will try to get to as many questions as possible immediately following the presentation. There will also be a quiz question tonight. The first respondent to en enter a correct answer in the chat wins a Northern Kentucky History Hour prize, and most importantly, bragging rights. Um, so let's meet tonight's speakers. Captain Chris Pitaluga has worked for the Kenton County Police for 15 years and has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. Throughout his career with Kenton County, he has worked as a patrol officer, field training officer, field training coordinator, fire investigator, accident reconstructionist, detective, detective sergeant, and patrol sergeant. He was promoted to captain in December 2020 and has served as the patrol commander since that time. As the patrol commander, he oversees patrol, the school resource officers, the firearms program, honor guard, fire investigations, and field training. As a side project, Chris has learned more about the history of the police department and has become the unofficial historian of the agency. Thank you for joining us, Chris. We, also have, we also have Nikki Owen of the Campbell County Police Department joining us. Nikki is originally born and raised in Richmond, Indiana, but has been a Campbell County resident since 1989. She has three daughters and currently resides in Melbourne, Kentucky. She has been the Campbell County Police Department since September of 2014, serving as the police clerk administrative assistant, as well as the department's credentialed victims advocate. She handles all aspects of managing the office at the police department, including working closely with the detectives, officers, and prosecutors' offices and managing the digital evidence systems, including both body-worn and dash camera systems. Nikki is most likely the first face you will see upon entering the department and the first voice you will hear when calling. Thank you for joining us, Nikki. Thank you. If you are both ready, we can begin tonight's presentation. Okay, can you hear us okay? You're good. Okay, so we'll start with the trivia question since we wanna start with that first. So the trivia question will be, if you know, when was the radio tower that's located at the Campbell County Police Department that was used for dispatch, when was that dismantled? So that, it, like the year would probably be good enough, but if you can get, get the month in the year, that'd be great. So that's your trivia question for tonight. So I'll start off with just explaining a little bit about what got both of us started into researching the history of our police departments. Um, in 2019, I got a letter from the Officer Down Memorial page uh, that's a website that lists officers that have um, lost their lives in the line of duty. We got a letter that stated that we had a chief that had lost um, his life in the line of duty and they wanted to get him put on the National Memorial. Well, we were kind of shocked because we'd never even heard of this chief. His name was George Benz. And as we got to researching him, it opened up so many doors to the rest of our history. And we really wanted to know how old our police department was. So it became our mission from 2019 until probably early this year, back in the spring of this year, when I finally figured out who our very first chief was and when we officially became a department. So for both Campbell and Kenton counties, um, back in 1898, 
the governor was presented with a bill that would provide for um, county police departments. For whatever reason, he vetoed that bill and most of the county was probably covered by city. You guys probably had Covington. Um, I'm sure. Yeah, and we were with Newport, the constables and the sheriff. So we weren't an official department, even though we were known as a patrol um, back as far back as 18, early 1890s that I could find, we were a, a Campbell patrol. Um, what we basically found out was that it was private patrolmen and our fiscal court had paid um, Newport $100 a month to patrol the county. Since the county was so big, nobody from Newport probably wanted to come all the way to the south end. So they would pay them as private patrolmen to work um, in the south end of the county. Let me just start with 1922. I think so. Okay, so in 1922, like I mentioned, the Kentucky Acts passed, um, and this allowed for Campbell County to name a police chief and an assistant chief. John Sheeran, who was at the time a Newport uh, Police Department detective, was named to the position. John was one of Newport's first detectives in 1903 and was also working as a private patrolman, paid by the fiscal court for about a dollar a day to patrol the south end of the county. John was chief from 1922 until 1926. We believe there were headquarters in both Newport and Alexandria at the time. And Chief Sheeran also spent some time in Washington, D.C. as part of the Capitol Police Force. During his time as chief, Campbell County had more road mileage than any other county in the state, with a primary road system covering 140 miles of the total 400. A bond was introduced in 1922 to construct this primary road system. There was not a lot of information that I could find about the police during this time, but I did find a couple articles about Chief finding an abandoned car that he decided to claim for himself for police use, and the fiscal court didn't agree with this, as well as a burglary from a local grocery store where the suspects stole cigarettes, stole cigarettes and tobacco, but not before helping themselves to milk and sandwiches that were at the grocery store first. Uh, so we started in 1922 as well under the same change to the law, um, allowing Kent County to name a police chief. Um, so 1922, two days after Campbell County on June 15th, uh, they named uh, Otto Frolicker as our first police chief who had been serving as a uh, Commonwealth detective. Um, and then two officers, uh, Harry Nooksall and Newman Armstrong as the first two county officers. Uh, the result of that was allowing them to enforce on Dixie Highway. Um, Dixie Highway had recently been paved as well as Campbell County. They were also investing a lot of money into roadways in Kenton County. And with the motor cars becoming prevalent on the roadway, uh, they were beginning to have a lot of problems with speeders and crashes as a result of that. Um, so they actually formed the Kenton County Patrol and our task was highway enforcement. We were a highway patrol in uh, 1922. And we we're primarily tasked with patrolling Dixie Highway, uh, 3L Highway, enforcing speed laws, as well as dealing with uh, lovers lanes, because they were uh, apparently having a big problem with uh, people using these automobiles on side roads. Um, and that's really what started us in 1922 was as a highway patrol. We weren't responding to calls or so much law enforcement as just dealing with these new uh, motor vehicles on the roadways. So. Yeah, along the same lines, in the, in the mid-1920s to 1930s, we also saw what was called a war on spooners, which was people that would park on the side of the road for petting parties, and that was a big deal. The police did not like that, and it was a traffic hazard, so that was also, you know, both counties saw the same uh, kind of situation. And what was interesting is as cars were coming on the road, you have to remember there's still a lot of horses, a lot of livestock, a lot of pedestrians. Um, and it was causing a lot of problems to the point that there's actually references to politicians referring to a speeder um, being a series of a crime as a murderer. I actually found references to where they said speeders should be treated like murderers because they're so dangerous. Maybe we should go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> so also, I'll, I'll just add in, and uh, we had another chief from 26 to 30. And like I said, he dealt with the war on spooners. Um, he also had a case of a, a, a funny case I thought was a possible murder mystery where a bystander on Licking Pike witnessed four men that were fighting outside their car. They heard a gunshot and saw a man fall to the ground and the car fled off. Officers found the gun, but no body. So the riverbanks were searched and many people questioned, but no victim was ever located. And uh, Chief Higgins, who was chief from 26 to 30, also served as a deputy sheriff, which was common for many officers to go back and forth between offices 
um, during that time and throughout our history. Move on to the 30s. I'm going to talk um, about patches. Well, I was just going to, on here, I put um, a former Campbell County police patch and a former King County patrol patch. Um, both these patches were used around the same time in the 60s. I don't know kind of the extent on each end of that. Um, we've had multiple patches, but I just, you know, included these on here because uh, we had them both about the same time. Uh, but moving on to the 30s. You, you go okay. first. So in the 1930s, Campbell County saw the department really start to take shape. Uh, Chief E.R. Brandis dressed the officers in snappy blue uniforms. He equipped the patrol cars with needed equipment and made a fixed schedule for the men to patrol and had call boxes installed along the patrol routes. Gambling was the talk of the town and Brandis was tasked with ridding the county of it. They quickly realized that their six patrolmen were no match for the issue and they called upon the Newport police and the sheriff to help. Jurisdictional lines were blurred during this time as I found many articles where not only Newport PD and the sheriff responded to calls, but the constables as well. Today, our agencies are much better, um, have much better defined roles and responsibilities. For example, um, Campbell County constables are civil paper service only. The sheriff's office handles taxes, car inspections, some warrant service and courthouse security and the police departments um, do most of the handling of calls for service, patrol and citations. Um, also in the 30s, we saw Chief James Wood, that was from 1934 to 36, and he, per he published the first annual report that we saw in 1935, and the annual report is something that most every police department does today to just give their stats for crimes and calls for service. Um, in the year 1935, Campbell County responded to 533 radio calls and 194 phone calls. Officers also made hospital runs in their cruisers, which was interesting for sick and injured people. Uh, the following year, 1936, these numbers almost doubled. So some of the issues of this decade were shacks being established along the railroad tracks south of Newport and traffic issues like we talked about with Kenton County. The residents of the shacks were stealing chickens from neighboring hen houses and drivers were starting to get careless with cases of improper parking and equipment, not stopping for stop signs, as well as driving without licenses. Drivers were cited and expected in court within 24 hours to answer to their charges. Currently, when you're cited, you can now pay your fine online or appear at your court date, usually about two months out. If you don't pay or show up, usually the state will just revoke your driver's license. So what's interesting here at the 30s is there are some similarities and differences between the two counties. Um, the 30s, we also switched to a navy blue uniform. Um, I don't have any photos of uh, the one before that, but I do have articles that reference us having a olive green uniform prior to that. Uh, I don't know what it looks like. It might be the one in this black and white photo here, because uh, this is around the time we switched uniforms uh, with one of our officers there. Um, we weren't so big into addressing gambling at this point. Um, you have to remember we were a result coming from being a highway patrol, uh, but the 30s is actually interesting. And it's when I think we began evolving into a full service police agency, because much like she mentioned, the lines getting blurred, uh, you started to see the county patrol being involved in a lot of crime enforcement and response because they were the ones who were out. You didn't necessarily always have a sheriff out. Um, a lot of the cities in Kent County were still policed by city marshals or very few city police departments. So we are finding ourselves in a lot of news articles where we talk about a Kent County patrolman and a, a sheriff deputy responding to burglaries or uh, other, other crimes that were occurring to the point where in the 1930s, there was actually a uh, what they refer to as a parlay between agencies in the county, including Covington, uh, King County Patrol, the Sheriff's Office, and the state, um, discussing who should be responding to crimes in King County, whose responsibility is it. Uh, and this is where I think the county patrol started to become more of a full service because the state basically promised that they would have state police who could do something at some point in the future, you know, kind of that promise down a road the state made. Uh, Covington, who was basically everything that happened in Kent County at the time, was controlled by Covington because they were the major city in northern Kentucky. Uh, they basically agreed, yeah, something needs to be done, but it's not our problem. Uh, the sheriff's office, Sheriff Thiel, actually stated that he didn't have the resources to deal with crime um, beyond what the county patrol was doing. Uh, so kind of by default, the fiscal court said, you know, we'll we'll fund the county patrol and we'll kind of step into that role more. 
Uh, and then through the years, that's basically what happened. And I think that's kind of the moment when we became sort of the police agency for the county versus the sheriff. Um, and that, that happened in the 30s. Also, an interesting thing I was going to mention in 1936 and 1937, we had Chief Edwin Offenbacher, who continued the war on traffic violations, but he equipped the cars with a loudspeaker system that allowed officers to yell out driving infractions to other drivers on the road. Um, that would be interesting today. Uh, the flood of 37 was, of course, a big story with the curfews put in place by most of the police departments on the river. And gambling and gang activity was still on the rise, probably more in Campbell County because we started getting the different clubs opening up. Of course, the most famous probably the Beverly Hills Supper Club. And it had its first robbery in 1937 of $10,000. So we had quite a few clubs, I think, starting in Newport and kind of getting to the rural areas. And so the gambling was more prevalent, um, I'm guessing. In yeah, I, I think you're probably, probably right because I don't find much for Kenton County. Um, until the 40s. And that's when you start seeing Kenton County sort of waging its war on gambling and uh, the the roadside clubs. And mm -hmm. uh, and that, that comes, I was actually going to talk about that in the 40s for us. Yeah, well, we'll have the same thing. So in, in the 40s for Campbell County, we saw uh, Phelan Plummer, who was son of the infamous Campbell County Sheriff Jules Plummer. From 38 until 44, Chief Plummer dealt with gambling, murders, and robberies. Slot machines were a huge issue with officers confiscating the ones that they could. Uh, the supper club was again robbed, this time of $21,000, and crime was becoming prevalent around the various clubs in the county. In 1944, Chief Plummer and two of his officers were actually removed from their post and fired over an incident where the department had confiscated 41 slot machines from a club, but somehow overnight the machines disappeared. And the judge exec, who was also the county judge at the time, demanded that they produce them and they couldn't, so they were fired. So that was interesting. Um, 44 through 48 was the era of Chief George Benz, who I mentioned in, in the first part of the presentation. Uh, Chief Benz also dealt with many of the same issues as his predecessor, such as traffic issues, drunk drivers, murder, and even an emergency plane landing near Ross um, on the river. Drownings in the river were reported often as well. Several people lost their lives trying to cross the river, uh, making their way back from the banks to the dredges they were employed on. September 1948 proved to be a fateful day for Chief uh, Benz and the Campbell County Juvenile Probation Officer Augustus Utendorfer. As they were traveling, of course, in Kitten County on Route 17, uh, yeah, <laughs> they uh, were transporting a juvenile back. They were coming back from transporting a juvenile to a detention center in Lexington. And for whatever reason, they lost control over their cruiser. Uh, they actually skidded on two wheels across the road and hit a milk truck um, head on. So. They were both killed uh, within about, I think they died within 40 minutes of each other. It was really sad. Um, they had worked together for several years in the department and were highly respected. They were 61 and 67 at the time of their death. So we that's what started our whole project was to get Chief Benz on the wall. So now he's on the National Memorial. He's on the Northern Kentucky Fallen Officers Memorial. And he's also on the, um, the Kentucky Fallen Officers down in Richmond. So we're gonna to try to do the same thing for August Utendorfer to get his name on there. And um, these two men are Campbell County's only line of duty deaths to this day. And hopefully it, it stays that way, but we wanna get them recognized. So that's been a, a, an interesting project to reach out and find their family members and get that all taken care of. And they're very, very thankful that we taken the time to do that. Uh, <clears throat> so moving to Kent County um, in the forties, um, this is when a lot of things were happening. Uh, part of the war effort, we became very involved with actually securing uh, facilities because they were concerned about sabotage uh, during World War II. And there was a large refinery uh, down in Covington um, that we were helping to secure as well as bridges and, and other infrastructure. Um, besides that, we also started getting a little bit more formal training. Um, the photo there on the left is actually uh, the Kent County Police Department who was attending training put on by the FBI on law and procedures. It was a two week uh, course. Um, part of that was also the one there in the middle where they were doing firearms training. Uh, our chief in the middle there is holding a Tommy gun. Um, and it's really hard to see, but in, in that picture also is a couple of our motorcycle units we had at the time. Um, and then uh, we also had a big war on cattle wrestling. And I know in the 1940s, you may think that's a little too modern for that, but there was actually a major problem. There's a lot of news articles and stuff that can be found about it where 
uh, there was a black market for beef and farmers were having cattle stolen. Uh, they were being illegally slaughtered and illegally sold. And there was a major health concern about, you know, this meat because it wasn't being uh, regulated in Ohio's refrigerated, stored, prepared. Uh, and the King County Police became very active in going after cattle rustlers. Um, along with this is when we started to become very involved in going after gambling. Um, you know, like she mentioned, the slot machines were a big issue at the roadside bars and, and cafes, uh, they often called them. Um, so, yeah. You definitely both felt, dealt with a lot of gambling. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably Campbell County a little more. You guys have a little more <laughs> reputation for Newport. There. That's right. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give Campbell County credit on this one. Um, I also found uh, where in the 40s, uh, I guess we had a little rivalry going on and we had uh, a pistol competition between our two departments. Uh, you have Kent County officers there at the range in the top photo. Uh, I think if we told officers today to wear ties to the range um, and vests, I don't know how that would go over. Uh, and then in the bottom photo there is uh, Camel County officers uh, celebrating their win. I believe they're holding a trophy they got. Yeah, it looks um, like for, Chief Plummer. In the winning the, the pistol match against us. So maybe they will have to talk to our officers about a rematch. Yeah, something. that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Move on to the 50s. Yeah. Okay, so the 1950s proved to be a time of turmoil in the PD for Campbell County. As Ralph Adams, only 27 years old, was named chief. It was a short one-year stint, followed by Earl Winters from 52 to 55. Hugh Hacker from 55 to 56, which actually was only four months technically, and finally ending with Harry Stewart in 1958. Morale in the department was low, horse thieves made the newspapers, and two new telephone systems were installed in the cruisers. The current merit board system was started in 1953 and is still used today. This is a system where the hiring, firing, and discipline of officers is handled by a five-person civilian board instead of the judge or now the judge executive of the county. Gambling was still a huge issue in the 50s, and each chief tried to rid the county of it, falling short and sometimes costing them their jobs. Judge Warren at the time went so far as to threaten to get rid of the force entirely if his orders were not carried out. The Campbell County Police Force at the time was six men strong with an annual budget of $35,000. And at this time, our headquarters were located in a building behind what is now uh, better known as Lakeside Place, which is now NKU's Callahan Hall. So we'd actually moved from Alexandria and Newport into this building in um, Highland Heights. And then after that, we moved back to Alexandria and then in the 80s or when the building was built in 79 to our current. So we moved around headquarters a lot. So it was a little confusing, you know, trying to do the research, trying to figure out. I found one picture of a cruiser that had been driven accidentally into a pond that was the pond in front of Lakeside Place. So that's why we figured out where it was. So somebody probably got in a little trouble over that. Uh, so in, in the 50s um, for Kenton County, it was actually when we saw our department get expanded. Um, you can see a photo there um, from the 50s. That was a pretty good sized police agency. Um, they had been saying through the 40s how we were insufficient for our size. And there had actually been a lot of public um, kind of outcry about needing more policing. Because uh, you remember at this time, um, basically, we were policing everywhere from uh, Bromley and Ludlow all the way down to, you know, Morning View and DeMossville. I think South Fort Mitchell um, and Covington were the only ones with really established departments. So I think a lot of the others had city marshals. Uh, I know Erlanger, I believe, had a police department at that point. But uh, we were really the kind of outside of Covington, the big police department at the time. Uh, and going into the 50s, we had 12 officers. Um, and I think they said they had 12 officers and one cruiser uh, that they basically switched every shift. Uh, they put two officers in. Um, so come the 50s, we actually, you know, got a better, uh, we had three departments, we had three buildings uh, where there would be a phone at each one that people could call in and then the officer would, would go from there. There was one on uh, Dixie and Kyle's, Dixie and Acadia, and then uh, Madison and uh, Highland was each where we had a post at that point. Um, also in the 50s in King County, um, they were seemed to be a little more maybe proactive with the attacking the gambling. Uh, they were actually getting frustrated with the state police because the state police were doing a lot of raids in the county and not including the county or the uh, fiscal court members uh, to the point where they actually got Frankfurt to share where they were getting some of the intel and allowed the King County police to begin doing some of these raids. 
um, which, you know, just hear some of the articles about where they were trying to, to address a lot of the gambling in the 50s. Um, and we only had two, I think we actually had one chief through the 50s. So uh, Chief Mershon. Yeah, you had one and we had like four. <laughs> yeah, so, and I think, you know, that was probably something to do with the political climate because yeah. here, you know, Mershon himself was actually going to uh, different locations um, looking for illegal gambling. So that was, that was the 50s in a nutshell. Yeah. So for Campbell County in the 1960s, things did start to improve with uh, the naming of Harry Stewart as the chief. Uh, he was named in 1958 and he remained in that position until his death in 1964 from an autom automobile accident in front of the spare time grill. If you're from Alexandria, you know exactly where that's at on 27. Uh, although he was in his cruiser at the time he was killed, he was not on duty. Um, AJ Jolly, another name you'll recognize, was a judge executive and he fully supported Chief Stewart. Uh, we also formed an auxiliary police force in 1962, which is what you see here in this picture. Um, it was comprised of eight men who helped out with various traffic and detail duties around the department. Um, we have something sort of similar um, now. We have what are called volunteers in police service or VIPs. And although we're very picky with what we let our VIPs do for liability reasons, um, they do make trips for us. Um, carrying paperwork back and forth so our officers don't have to do it between the department and fiscal court and things like that. Um, some of the other county agencies or city agencies such as Alexandria, they have a huge uh, VIPs force and they actually do help with traffic enforcement at big events and things like that. Um, interesting thing about Chief Stewart is he made $4,600 per year, uh, which is a way less than what a chief makes today. <laughs> Uh, perhaps the biggest story involving the PD at the time was the removal of the chief by Governor Burt Combs. Combs was upset, again, that there was still a gambling issue within the county, and he expected Chief Stewart alone to solve the issue that was taking place within the city of Newport. Although the chief explained that this was a jurisdiction of Newport Police Department, the governor stood his ground and removed him from his office. Stewart appealed his removal and lost the first appeal, but after a petition was signed, by 70, over 7,500 Campbell County citizens, as well as A.J. Jolly, the governor reversed his decision. The crime in the 1960s included the usual burglaries, auto thefts, rapes and prowlers, as well as homicides, numerous dog bites, and juvenile runs. Auto mishaps were still prevalent, but with a new two-way radio system that connected the PD with fire departments and other PDs, uh, efficiency was on the rise. And something I thought was interesting as a, from a civilian standpoint, um, I always think that crime nowadays is so horrible but reading some of the crimes that happened in this time period, crime was way more prevalent and, and the people took things into their own hands more. Lord. Yeah, it was crazy. And, you know, especially I think for our area, you know, when I, when I first moved to Campbell County and I thought we lived in Mayberry, you know, in 1989, I was like, there's nothing in this like a little farming town, but you know, there's, there's crime now, but nothing like it was back then. So in the 60s, um, Chief Mershon, who had served from 46 to 62, um, we got James Callahan Jr. as our uh, chief, and he would serve from 62 until 82, so 20 years as our chief moving forward. Uh, this is also um, when you saw a lot more technology. Uh, there's a photo of a patrolman working the radios in our police department at the time, which was uh, up with a uh, I believe where the Walgreens is now in Fort Wright. Um, we also began putting radars in the car. So there's an officer, uh, one of our captains actually, or assistant chief, I'm sorry, testing out a new radio, I believe in 63. Um, and you can see another photo there uh, where they're actually beginning to deploy the radar and, and sighting people. And I believe that is on uh, Dixie Highway in front of where the town center is now, uh, where that, that occurred. Um, so that's when I think we started seeing a lot more technology begin working its way into law enforcement. Uh, we got the two-way radios, I believe, in the 50s. We had one-way radios in the 40s, mm -hmm. uh, which the one-way radios was kind of interesting because they would basically call the officer on the radio and say, you need to call, uh, call post, and they would have to drive somewhere. And for us, um, they would usually, you know, go to somebody's house or, you know, a little bar or grocery store somewhere in the rural parts of the county and then call and find out where they needed to respond to. So the two-way radios in the 50s uh, really changed things because now you can have that direct communication. Um, of course, being rural, we've always had issues with the radio working 
because uh, you had a lot of areas where you just couldn't communicate on the radio. Um, and that has really only recently changed when we've gone to the all digital systems that we use now. Uh, even when I started 15 years ago, we still had parts of the county where you could not get out on your radio. Uh, and that was just, you know, the nature of the job. Um, so the 60s, I think we started seeing a lot of technology change. Yeah, I think you guys were a little bit ahead of us on that. Seems like with dispatch and things. Um, I think our dispatch started in the 70s. Well, the, the dispatch in, in King County, I think is really interesting. You know, you could probably do an hour thing on it yeah. itself. Because uh, you started out where when we had the one-way dispatch, we were using Cincinnati was actually our dispatch mm -hmm. center. Uh, and then when we went to two-way, we were doing some stuff with the airport, uh, which got built in the 40s, um, as well as Covington. And Covington kind of became our dispatch center. Um, and then, you know, as we got later on, you had a county dispatch, an Erlanger dispatch, and a Covington dispatch. Um, and now we've all come under the uh, communications board as the Kent County dispatch. Uh, so it's kind of just interesting that at one point we were all under Covington and now everyone's kind of under the county dispatch. Um, so there's, there's a lot of interesting story there too, I think. Yeah, yeah. But, the 70s? On to the 70s. So I kind of combined our 70s and 80s together. Um, the 70s and 80s saw Stewart's replacement uh, with Chief George Arnold. Arnold would remain chief until 1982 when Tom Bridges took over after that. The 70s brought about the beginnings of the KSP central criminal files used by police to record a person's criminal history. This allowed officers to quickly access a person's information when they were arrested or questioned. The police department was 12 men at the time and the chief made $10,356. So they'd upped the, the rate. The 1970s also saw the hiring of our first female officer, Joni Bopenheim. Joni was previously employed by Newport PD as their first female as well. Uh, the rank of captain was added in 1973 at the Campbell County Police Department. And the officers were responding on average to about 1,500 calls per year and covering 165,000 miles in their cruisers. Uh, Campbell County Attorney George Mullenkamp shut down all the bingo games in the county and they became illegal. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and in late 1978, the new and current headquarters was built on US 27 and Constable Drive opening up in early 1979. The building has remained the same with some minor interior upgrades added along the way. A radio tower that was erected in the 1980s stood until January 9, 2020. The tower was for the dispatch center. It was located inside the PD. Um, it employed both civilian dispatchers as well as officers that dispatched when they weren't patrolling. I don't think we could talk our officers today into dispatching. <laughs> By 1990, the department employed 18 officers with six additional vacancies that were needed to be filled. Uh, Chief Bridges at that time started the DARE program that you're probably familiar with in the, our, our department. He upgraded our 911 systems and allowed officers to have take-home cruisers. And he also added programs such as the MART team and we had two K-9 units. So you can see in the picture there, um, our plaque that hangs in our wall uh, where the building was built. And I couldn't find a whole lot of articles or pictures of construction. That'll be a, another project. Um, but the building outside looks exactly the same. Now we have some trees and bushes and some flowers. Um, but uh, dispatch was interesting because lightning hit that tower, I think, twice. Um, and one funny story, when dispatch was in what is now our chief's office, and there was an officer dispatching, I think they were just sitting around kind of, you know, in between calls. And he had his hand on one piece of equipment. The lightning struck the building. It hit him, shot him like six feet across the room. Um, I think it might have broke one of his fingers. Um, but that was a good story we laughed about. The actual officer was at the, our open house for 100 years, so we made fun of him for that. But um, dispatch was, it sounded like a fun time to talk to people, to have the dispatchers there in the building and all the interaction. So um, that was, you know, something different. Well, that's um, on the right there is the police department that we moved into in uh, 75 um, that we are still also in. Um, and this is building also had dispatch was put here. And it's it's funny because there's a lot of talk, you know, we're, we're located out uh, in Independence. And there was actually some concern about putting the police department so far out in the county because uh, there was very little out here at the time. They were actually talking about how this was going to bring um, law enforcement to the remote parts of the county, um, which now, you know, you don't necessarily think of independence as a remote, remote part of the county. 
Uh, and then in the corner there is also a picture of uh, our first canine, that's canine rebel uh, with his handler. Um, and then here in the next slide, um, these are the uh, few female officers. Um, Lee Haynes was our first female officer in the 70s. Um, she, uh, <laughs> kind of an interesting story about her is the trend kind of in the 70s with female officers uh, was they weren't necessarily put on the road in a patrol type capacity. Uh, they were usually put into office work or meter maids uh, or some, you know, what was viewed as a, a less hands-on position. Uh, and what's kind of interesting about uh, Officer Haynes is when she got employed by the county, the county basically said, we don't have meter maids. We don't have uh, any of these roles to put her in. So she's going to work on the road uh, as a patrol officer like anyone else. And uh, that's that's what they did. And that's what she did. Uh, she ultimately left us and went to Edgewood, uh, where she became the first female canine handler in the state of Kentucky uh, and was also very involved in uh, pushing for women in law enforcement. She was part of some national uh, women law enforcement organizations, um, but that that was done a lot while she was at Edgewood. Uh, and well, it's, we were talked about this earlier, but the difference in the, the two first females ours, I have her actual personnel file still and I was reading through her paperwork and she made a comment in a employee employment questionnaire that she would love to go on patrol and she was an expert marksman, but there was just too, pa too much paperwork in the police department and they didn't really let her out on the road much. So I kind of look at her, you know, as more of a glorified clerk. I think at the time they kept her busy with paperwork. I don't think she got to do quite, you know, what she wanted to do. So I'm not sure how much she did at Newport, but she was also um, a Campbell County Jail matron too. So I'm not sure what capacity she did there, but uh, very interesting stories. All right, so uh, in the 80s here, you know, a lot started happening in the 80s. And something that I th think we started seeing was sort of the accountability in law enforcement. Um, what was beginning to happen is when officers did things they weren't supposed to, they were being prosecuted and getting in trouble as, as they should. Um, but what was happening was they would bring officers in and talk to the officer as if it was, you know, a policy violation. Um, and the officers would say, you know, yes, I did this or whatever. And then that was being used against them criminally. Uh, and there became the issue of, you know, were the officers losing their civil rights in this process? Uh, so you saw the uh, Policeman's Bill of Rights come into play, basically codifying that, you know, yes, if you have to discipline an officer within the department, that's one thing. But if you want to pursue an officer criminally, that's something else. And they still have the same rights of any other criminal suspect. Because uh, there was some issue where basically officers were not getting those criminal rights uh, that a suspect would have that wasn't a police officer. Um, so that came into play. And I think you'll start seeing even today, this accountability story uh, kind of keep playing. And I think it started late seventies, kind of eighties. Um, the eighties, we also saw another big change which was, which was the drunk driving. Um, this is when you started seeing a lot of effort about targeting drunk drivers. Uh, here in the article, you'll see what they call the D-Day crackdown, which was a uh, statewide uh, campaign. It was for drunk, drunk day where they were coming after drunk drivers. Um, and you started seeing a lot of effort towards addressing uh, those issues. Okay. Move on to the 90s. Well, you got you have an 80s page. Well, I kind of talked about the 80s. I can talk about the pictures. <laughs> um, I mixed the 80s with the 70s because there wasn't a whole lot of um, newspaper articles and things at that time. And unfortunately, there's nobody that still worked at the police department I got talked to. Um, in the center there, in the center bottom, you see Chief Bridges. Um, he is actually still alive and, and lives in Florida. So he also helped me out with a lot of the um, history. Um, on the left there, you see a marijuana grow that they had confiscated. I believe it was $30,000 grow. So that was a, a big one. And um, Dave Lang or Officer Lang with his dog, I believe the name was Zeus. Don't quote me on that. That's a good dog. Name, yeah, so. sounds good. Um, Dave actually just passed away not too long ago, but he was one of the two canine handlers. Um, we do not currently have a canine unit and we haven't had one for, I would say, 10, 15 years at this point. So um, we're one of the not too many agencies that don't have a canine. Yeah, we we had a couple canines, 70s and 80s, and then it went away. And then uh, Officer 
uh, who ended up being Sergeant Brad Benton. We started our canine program, and we've had one uh, basically for the last 20 years almost. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I have another slide here, just a little bit with uh, Kent County. Uh, on the left there with the interstate, that is 75 southbound near uh, 275. Uh, underneath the truck there towards the top of the picture is a Kenton County police cruiser. Um, I don't know what happened here, but somehow a truck ended up parked on our cruiser. Um, the officer, you know, made it out. Um, but I think it's interesting, you know, one, it shows 75 in the 80s. Also that tow truck in the middle there is Ken's Towing, which is still a, a major uh, business in Ken County today. Um, in the middle there, um, I just kind of like this picture because it to me seems very just 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, standing there with the, the cigarette yeah, and the shotgun. Like and, yeah. Um, and then that's Chief uh, R.C. Richardson to the right reaching for the shotgun. And then that's Officer John Keene holding the shotgun. Uh, then the picture there of the burned up scene, uh, the man holding the camera is Dave Jansen, who uh, is still very active in Northern Kentucky. He's a member of the King County Emergency Management um, today. Uh, and he was also a local mayor here until recently. Um, and what's kind of interesting about this is he started basically being kind of the countywide fire investigator uh, back in the 80s, um, which has continued in various forms um, to where there's still a Kent County fire investigation team uh, that operates uh, underneath the Kent County Police Department, but it's actually made up of uh, police officers and firefighters from throughout Kent County. Um, you know, Villa Hills, Independence, Erlanger, uh, you know, all, all participate on it. Um, but that's basically a program he kind of started uh, 40 years ago, or a trend he started 40 years ago. I um, mean, he's still around, so you, many of you probably know him. All right, so the 90s. Uh, by the 1990s in Campbell County, there was talk about moving our dispatch center at the PD into the Campbell County Consolidated Dispatch Center in Newport which would save the county upwards of $100,000. This was um, completed by 2000. Chief Sanfis took office in 1994, and he was chief until 2004. Uh, the 1990s saw several murders, so it was a crazy time for whatever reason. Uh, one of those murders took almost 17 years to solve. Uh, we had a young woman's body that was found in a rural cistern, and the suspect finally confessed to both her murder and the murder of a Dayton grandmother some 17 years later. So that was a very interesting case. Um, an elderly Melbourne man was beaten to death by five suspects, one of which happened to be his neighbor. There were some juveniles involved in that case, too. Um, and in yet another case, a car was found in a rural Campbell County pond with a deceased woman in the trunk. Uh, I believe the gas pedal was jammed with a log when they pulled it out. Um, the case investigation le led to the confession and the arrest from her ex-husband, who admitted to choking her to death while she slept, putting her in the trunk and dumping the car into the lake. So that was a big time for murder in the 90s for whatever yeah, reason and it was a little crazy back then but do you guys have anything in the 90s uh well the 90s was kind of another um big decade uh we switched to the uniform um in 92 we switched to the uniform that is still our uh class a uniform uh, that i'm wearing here uh, basically the only difference between that one and this one uh we don't necessarily wear the tie as much now and we have our Centennial badge that we're wearing this year instead of the normal badge like he's wearing in the picture there. Uh, it's also when we switch to the patch that we use um, still today. Um, and that actually is what that photo was, was a photo to show off the new uh, patch on the cruisers and the uniform itself. Uh, the 90s also is when we purchased our first evidence van, which is being shown off at the county building in that photo. Um, which was a big deal. Uh, we started an accident reconstruction team, our STAR team. Uh, you often see in the news when there's a major crash somewhere in King County that, that it'll say the King County Serious Traffic Accident Reconstruction Team. Uh, that began in the 90s. Um, and this van, part of its role is to support that team. Uh, we also started our evidence collection unit in the 90s, which we still use today. Um, we assist a lot of the cities when they have uh, major crimes. A lot of the cities don't necessarily have the equipment or the personnel to handle major crimes so we we come and assist them uh, we no longer use this van um, it has been uh, surplus and we have a new larger one now uh, that serves our model roles much better 
Uh, and then at the bottom, it's just a photo of the department, um, and, you know, how much we have grown and, and changed by the 90s. Uh, I don't think there's anything else I want to cover there. I think that about does it. That's Officer Ken Berry in the picture there. All right, so 2000s in Campbell County. Some of you might recognize um, the mugshot on the top uh, left corner, um, but there's other stories that happen, and I'll get to this one in a second. But uh, a shootout made the news uh, big time in Alexandria with a bank robber named James Kirk, who led police on a five hour chase that ended up in county jurisdiction right off Moreland Drive. Shooting at officers and hitting officer Steve Ellison, he then led police back down to the old Ameristop location. I believe it's Cheers Liquor Store now. Um, and he was cornered near the, he was surrounded near the gas pumps and he pulled out a gun and took his own life. Um, Ellison luckily only had superficial wounds to his head, abdomen, and leg. Uh, the following year, a DUI suspect who was being held in the department's holding cell, which just happens to be right across from my desk, which is now a supply closet, um, he tried to hang himself with his own belt during the observation period. Uh, two rookie officers, and I'll tell you, one of them is our current Captain Nitschke. Um, he was on probation at the time. They found him during a routine check and freed him. Uh, they did give him medical attention, and he recovered. This incident happened one day before they were, start, were supposed to start construction on the new holding cell. Um, they did that downstairs, and now we have no holding cell, so we don't have to worry about any of that. Yeah, this building used to have uh, two cells in it as well, but we, yeah. we quit doing that a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, 2004 was the year Chief Keith Hill took office. Um, Chief uh, Hill still lives in Alexandria with his wife. Uh, he put dash cams in every cruiser, as well as MDTs or the computers that the officers use, and he introduced the current cruiser design, which is the... I should have included a picture, but it's uh, two, the blue and black swoosh, we call them the swooshes. Yeah. Um, later in his tenure, he also transitioned the cruisers from the Crown Victorious to the Ford Interceptors. And in the mid 2000s, Campbell County Police and Highland Heights Police teamed up to do a pedophile sting operation that was filmed for the show to catch a predator. So it's kind of interesting to go back and watch that whole thing because it was made the, the TV show. Uh, seven men were ultimately. Uh, arrested from that sting operation. So, of course, like I mentioned before, the most talked about case of the 2000s in Southern Campbell County, at least, was the murder of Bob Bosley in 2005. Uh, with his wife first calling 911 to report an intruder and causing nearby schools to go on lockdown, the police department was all hands on deck to catch the suspect that Amy Bosley claimed had run off into the woods. Um, after no suspect or tracks were found in a lengthy investigation, it was found that Amy had actually killed her husband in his sleep shot him, I think, nine times uh, with her children sleeping upstairs and then staged the house to look like a break-in had occurred. Uh, the case and many officers that worked it were featured on several television specials, including forensic files and snapped. Um, I still, up until probably last year, was getting open records requests for other TV places or other TV channels that wanted to do another show on it. So if you Google it, it's out there um, absolutely everywhere. Um, so bringing us up more currently, when since I started working at the PD, um, 2015 brought us a new chief um, when Chief Hill retired. Uh, that would be Chief um, Craig Sorrell. This brought about many challenging cases and many changes within the department regarding policy and technology. Um, some of our notable cases um, would be the Tim Nolan. Well, let's start. Some of those would be Allender domestic violence murder, the retired Judge Tim Nolan human trafficking case. That was a huge one that made the news. Um, I still get calls about that one. And uh, one of the saddest ones was the David Bauma fatal car accident, uh, where his car went over the side of the Combs Hill Bridge into the Ohio River. Um, the recovery and the identification effort took 11 painstaking days. Um, that was a rough one because we got, it was a freak accident. People saw different things. People thought they saw multiple people in the river. We had to go back and watch Artemis, you know, the Artemis cameras. Um, and what happened was about, I believe it was maybe a day later, Middletown police reached out to us and said, hey, we have a missing persons report. The car matches the description. That's how the ID, um, the identification came about. But the hard part was the river was just not going to let us bring the car up. And Boone County Water Rescue 
Um, I think their river was running at like two and a half miles per hour. They had to leave it for, yeah, for 11 days and people got very upset about that, but it just was not, was unsafe for the divers to get it out. But they managed to then recover him, of course, and, you know, give his family some closure. Um, let's see what else happened in 2015. Um, changes are at our police department were plentiful, such as um, transitioning to electronic files. So that makes us almost paperless at this time, which is great. Uh, the department deployed body-worn cameras in 2016 for every officer, as well as a digital evidence system that automatically applies retention periods and allows for easy sharing with the officers and the prosecutors. It used to be when we did a discovery, we'd have to gather all the paper and gather all the videos and try to put it on a disc and have somebody take it to the prosecutor's office and the prosecutor would misplace it and we'd have to do it all over again. So this is basically with five clicks, I can send you know, an entire case file to our prosecution and it's all done, which is really nice. And we can track who, who watches videos and who downloads things. So that is nice. Um, our police department with that original building received many internal upgrades. We added office spaces and improved areas for the officers, such as the kitchen and bathrooms and things like that, added locker rooms. Um, improved our evidence and processing areas. We also transitioned to a new duty uniform, as well as changing um, from SIGs to Glock handguns with optics. We also have added a full-time electronics crime unit detective uh, who stays very, very busy. Um, he also does not only Campbell County, but he does do some, some other agencies, whoever needs their help. Um, he has a ton of training. He's constantly at a training. Yeah, Things are constantly there. training, um, <laughs> changing. Um, one of the most interesting things, he just went on a training and it was about downloading the, the computer systems in cars. And it was insane. He came back and told us all about all this training he had and all these neat things that your car fob communicated with your car. And even if you didn't plug your phone in, your car was downloading stuff. And we actually have put that in, in play in a case he's working on right now when they've been able to get, a, you just be amazed at how much information they get out of these cars, you know, the newer cars. Um, we also added a grant funded police social worker. So she's been a great asset because of course, a lot of our, not cases, but a lot of our calls, um, sometimes are more civil in nature or somebody just wants to rant and rave and somebody to listen to them. And the officers don't necessarily have the time to give them resources and don't know the resources. So, um, Angie Weinel, she's been great in that position as far as that, um, Silver Grove Police Department was, a, was acquired by us in 2016, and we also hired our first African-American police officer. We also added SROs or school resource officers into elementary schools, bringing our total SROs to five officers. Um, the chief also instituted the CARE team, which is the crisis assistance response effort, and that was formed to help victims in crisis as well as families uh, that we saw that needed help during the heroin epidemic that's been going on. Um, so that was lots of changes here just in the past eight years that I've been in the police department, just tons of changes. So kind of stepping back to the 2000s uh, for Kent County, um, the picture in the bottom there uh, with the silver box, that is a uh, cruiser camera or dash camera system. Uh, that is the same brand we have. Some of the equipment was a little different, but that's the same brand we have. That silver box is actually a VCR. Um, it was in the trunk. Um, it was locked. Uh, basically, you had a VCR in there, and when your camera recorded, it went on that VCR, and then once the tape was full, uh, you would take it out, and you would drop it into evidence with a record of, you know, the dates that you uh, used that tape, and then if you needed something off of it, you had to find it on the, we used eight-hour tapes. We still had those when I started. Not so different than ours now. We just use yeah. SD cards. <laughs> and you had, to, you, had to find, uh, you had to find it on your eight-hour tape um, and make a copy of it onto another tape. Um, the computer there is a MDC, um, what she referred to as the MDT, same kind of the same difference nowadays. Uh, that is part of the computer aided dispatch or CAD, uh, which really changed the game because you used to have to do everything through the radio or just take people's words out on the street. Um, now that this is tied in everything, this is where you can search warrants, criminal histories, uh, run the vehicles, the license plates, uh, VINs, serial numbers, uh, you know, pretty much do everything through that, that computer now. And it's really, I think, changed uh, how, how you work in the field. Um, also, there's a photo of me because I think that was probably the most significant event for uh, Kent County anyway, was when they hired me uh, in the 2000s. Um, that was my first uh, department photo. 
Uh, and then in the top there, you know, I haven't talked a lot about our cases because you could really, you could talk a lot about cases. Uh, but this was kind of a major case that happened. Uh, it was just the Craven murder. That was the uh, pilot who uh, his wife was having an affair. Um, her and her boyfriend came up with this plot to kill him and get the insurance money. Uh, they actually hired a hitman uh, to carry out the task. Um, and they, we ultimately learned evidence had been thrown away. So our officer spent 16 days uh, combing through the landfill uh, looking for the evidence from that crime. They actually were able to find it um, and all the parties uh, uh, were convicted. And I believe the, the hitman they hired uh, actually was sentenced to the death penalty. Um, but you can find a lot on the, the Craven murder. Uh, here are some of the, the photos with the uh, cruiser striping you were talking about yeah. and the, the vehicle recovery. Um, yeah. The top left is Allender. That was the domestic violence murder of his wife. Uh, he was convicted. I believe he's up for parole in 2037, which happens to be the year I can retire. So we'll see if he gets out earlier or not. <laughs> and then, of course, Judge uh, Nolan. I can't remember how long he's in for human trafficking, but it's a while. <clears throat> So in the 2010s, um, for us, uh, on the top left, there is a couple of our officers uh, flying drones um, down in Covington. Uh, we started our drone program. Our pilots are FAA um, certified to fly the drones. Uh, we use these. Uh, it's not sometimes when you mention the drone, you know, people get a little bit of that whole, you know, you're flying a drone over my house spying on me thing. Um, we haven't used a drone for that type of situation. We use it a lot. We partner with the SWAT team. I uh, will provide um, overwatch for the SWAT team or fly up to windows, look in the windows. Uh, we recently had a case where a drone actually found the suspect hiding one of the bedrooms and was able to direct the, the SWAT team uh, to that person. We also use it for like River Fest. Um, so if we get a report of uh, some type of criminal activity somewhere with how crowded the banks and the streets are, uh, we'll fly the drone over and get eyes on what's happening. Then we can direct the officers in or, you know, tell them it's unfounded or nothing's happening. Uh, so we use it for a lot of Overwatch stuff. We use it for uh, missing persons. Uh, it's got some, you know, FLIR capability. So if a child gets lost or something, we can try to deploy the drone to alert, search uh, larger areas. Um, ICAC really started kind of in the 2000s, but I think it really got its legs under it in the 2010s. Um, ICAC is uh, now a full-time officer. Um, the ICAC program is basically what goes after the uh, child predators, the people who are trying to prey on children through the internet, the uh, chat rooms, the child pornography. Um, and that's something we work with full-time now um, with the state with full-time officer who does that. That's all they, they focus on are those types of investigations. And that's actually, we work a lot with Camel County's uh, electronic crimes detective um, to help us gather some of that evidence. Uh, we also had the tornado in Southern Kent County that um, took four, four lives when it came through. Uh, that was a major event for us at the time. Um, and really, I think everyone did marvelous, but it really strained the resources because that's you know not something you, you plan for is to have the entire you know, Southern part of your county um, devastated. Uh, and we also do, first of all, that's just kind of a cool photo with the helicopter. Uh, but we also do training now with air care on uh, landing air care and stuff. So all our officers are trained on uh, how to establish landing zones for air care. Um, and the fire department always handles it. Thank goodness. But technically, we are trained on how to direct the helicopter to the LZ. Uh, but that's that's a job the fire department can, can keep doing. Uh, <clears throat> So I think we're going to move on to uh, where we're at now. It's 2020. So, of course, the big story of 2020, as you can see by the mask, was the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this pandemic changed life kind of as we knew it at the PD for quite a while and is still okay, rearing its ugly head again, seems yes. like. Yeah. Uh, mask, gloves, and hand sanitizer became staples of the uniform, and officers were asked to continue to do their jobs as well as keep themselves, the public, and their coworkers safe from the virus. Uh, calls were mostly taken by phone instead of in person when they were able to. Court basically shut down and then eventually went to Zoom calls. Uh, the office staff worked from home as reduced to the total number of people in the office and officers were asked not to mingle in the department. Uh, quarantining and sickness caused a lot of missed work and overtime. And um, 
I think we're probably maybe at three quarters of our department ended up um, getting getting COVID-19 and, and are still getting COVID-19 um, sometimes more than once. Uh, we had one officer that got quite sick and luckily he made a full recover, but he was out for a good six months. Um, so our officers also um, ended up working at the jail because Camel County Jail was so effective that they had nobody to work. So we had officers there um, for, gosh, two, three months straight uh, working overtime to do that. Um, COVID-19 showed us that we could still serve the public no matter what, but we just had to think outside the box. Some changes actually allowed us to be more efficient in our jobs by doing almost everything electronic or over Zoom or over Teams. Um, for example, it seems like a really simple, logical thing, but our CDW, our court designated workers office, every time they have a juvenile that they get a complaint on, they would you know, talk to the officer, have the officer write up the complaint, have the officer take the complaint down to the CDW, then the CDW would write up their part, then they'd have the officer come back, and then we figured out, oh, wow, we can do this all over email, and it works great. So saves us a lot of gas, and the officers from going back and forth, now they just send it to us, and I get it signed, notarize it, and send it right back. Um, so as you see in the picture, that's one of our SROs, Phil Harney, there on the left at, uh, he's at Riley Elementary. Um, and of course, everybody was in mass, but the, the kids did really great with everything through all this. And then the bottom picture is um, two of our SROs and also an SRO, uh, I believe he's Taylor Mill. Um, he works for Taylor Mill, Jimmy Pointer. Yeah. And that's at our Cops and Kids. So they were still able to do Cops and Kids. We do every December, it just changed a little bit. They actually shopped without the kids. So it was different, um, but it's definitely changed. Like I said, everything we've had to do. Um, I was the only person that stayed in the office all through the pandemic, um, I felt perfectly safe. We have bulletproof glass. We didn't uh, close our lobby. Uh, we even tried to still fingerprint people. We tried to do it very safely and got everybody all masked and, and gloved up. So, you know, we didn't want to cut off some of the services we had, um, but we did limit the amount of people. Um, actually, our custodial staff, they sent her home. So I was actually, I was cleaning lady for eight weeks too, which was interesting. <laughs> Uh, duties added to my normal job, but all in all, I think our officers did a great job of still responding when they needed to, but keeping everybody safe and finding new, you know, new innovative ways to do everything. Uh, <clears throat> so kind of, you know, picking up where she left off with COVID and the bottom right there with the uh, van, that is our current uh, evidence van, but it does so much now that we Title it the Special Investigations Van. It supports our drone, our accident reconstruction, our evidence collection, our detectives. Um, it, it's kind of our all-purpose vehicle now. Uh, but what we're actually doing there, she mentioned the fingerprinting. Uh, part of the problem that happened was uh, most professionals, you know, the teachers, the doctors, when they have to get fingerprinted for their state licenses, uh, they would go to a local police department and get their fingerprints done. Uh, which, if you know, a lot of people may not realize that. Well, all the police departments quit doing the fingerprinting. Uh, and we actually had some medical professionals reach out to us and talk about how they needed to get fingerprinted for their medical licenses or they weren't going to be able to practice medicine anymore, which during COVID was probably not be a good thing to have doctors who couldn't, uh, who couldn't work. Uh, so we actually took our van out to a hospital and um, did fingerprinting for them so they could get their medical licenses taken care of. Uh, to try to keep things going. So I was, you know, kind of the... Yeah, I think we had, I remember back, it <laughs> seems like it was a long time ago, we had 25 or 30 nurses that all needed theirs at the same time. And they they just, we just scheduled them in one at a time in the building. And they were very thankful because like you said, nobody was doing it. Yeah. And so then, you, something then you don't think about. Or can't get them, you know, and that's... Um, yeah. So uh, also here, uh, I have the picture of Officer Shiding um, in two different uniforms. Uh, I was kind of going to show the one uh, with the campaign hat on, which is the big like state trooper hat, you might think of it. Um, that is still the same uniform that you saw in an earlier slide from 92, uh, but kind of minus the tie, like I mentioned. Um, but I was going to show that's still a uniform we use today. Uh, then in the middle there is what we call our class B uniform. That's kind of our duty uniform. That's our, our everyday work uniform uh, with the ball cap. Uh, and then I have a photo of just a couple of our detectives. That's Detective Kenner with the beard. And then uh, Sergeant Ressler, who is our detective sergeant, standing next to him. Uh, and then just a picture of what our current cruiser design looks like. Um, we're almost all Dodge Chargers for our fleet now. We have a couple uh, uh, Durangos, but it's almost all, yeah, all we're, Chargers. We're switching from interceptors to all SUVs. So that's an interesting change. 
Yeah, it's um, we were going to start phasing more Durangos, but with the supply chain issues, mm -hmm. the price of Durangos has increased uh, significantly more than the price of chargers. So uh, you know, to be cost effective, we're listing up the chargers right now. Uh, but there are some limitations. Uh, we have some officers. Um, part of the reason we wanted to go to Durango's is because our officers do so much that they just don't have the uh, storage space. Mm -hmm. You know, one example is we have an officer on the SWAT team who carries his SWAT gear with him in case he gets a call, uh, and the charger just simply wasn't working yeah. for that. I and mean, he was having to carry stuff in his, his back seat. And then when he got a prisoner, he'd have to get somebody else to take some of his gear or something. So well, that was a big reason why you see a lot of officers with Durango's. It's just we have so much equipment we carry mm -hmm. uh, different responsibilities. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of just to that. I got a couple extra slides here on the end. Um, just a photo with all of Camel County's uh, police chiefs, minus the one that's driving you insane. Yeah, I will find a picture of Chief Higgins before <laughs> I retire. Um, I've exhausted about everything, even tracking his relatives down on Facebook, making them look in their basement. Um, eventually I'll find it though. It just takes time. But um, I think it's interesting to mention, you know, we talked about when our departments were two people and six people and up 12 and 18. So currently, uh, Campbell County, you might want to talk about our numbers. Campbell County is 37 employees, um, two civilians included, which would be myself and the police social worker and the five SROs. We currently have two captains, one major, one chief, and we have one, two, three full-time detectives. And then of course, all the other special details, Mart and FIT, and there's a lot of different teams that the, the officers can be on. Um, it's hard to keep up with all of them, actually. Um, but there, there's something for everybody. Yeah, there. something for everybody in the police department. So it really has grown, and I'm sure it will keep growing. Um, maybe I'll get a helper one day, you know, but uh, right now we're, I think we're one spot away from being full. So we're in pretty good shape right now. So... Uh, our numbers are, are very similar. Um, we're currently 38 sworn. Uh, normally we're 37. We do have a grant funded uh, QRT officer, which is kind of equivalent to the social worker in a lot of regards, but they basically work at a life learning center. Uh, and they basically work to try to help get people treatment and rehab and um, get them somewhere to, to change their life, turn their life around. Um, and that's a grant funded position. Um, outside of that, we have 37. We have a chief, assistant chief, two captains, five sergeants. Um, we have an ICAC detective, three general detectives, uh, the detective sergeant. Um, you know, we're, we're not currently fully staffed, but we're only a couple officers down. So I think, you know, we're slightly bigger than us, actually. Yeah, we're slightly doing, bigger. Uh, pretty well. Um, and the services, you know, we offer now, I always say that I feel. Um, you're not going to find many departments our size that do as much as we do with our uh, accident reconstruction team that gets called all over um, northern Kentucky, really. I mean, mm -hmm. um, we have the FARO where we do 3D imaging of crime scenes and accident scenes. We have our evidence collection unit, uh, our canine program, our drug strike force, our DEA task force. Mm -hmm. Officer, uh, I think we're team yeah members. we're more multi jurisdictional team um, because in Campbell County there's what twelve different police departments, so um, we use a lot of uh, multi jurisdictional. So we have one person on on a multi jurisdictional SWAT or well we have a couple on SWAT. Yeah, the same thing for Mark. So we we share resources. We share SWAT yeah, you guys have the best SWAT team, so <laughs> but we have the best member. So. <laughs> He'll know who he is if he's watching this. Um, but yeah, it, it 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 makes it tricky in in our county. I don't know if it's the same as yours, but um, you could ask your secretary or your clerk. But when people hear Campbell County Police, they think that's all encompassing of the entire yeah, county, and is. and I know all the answers, and I'll take care of all the things. And it's most people really don't realize that each city, almost each city, has their own police department, and that's that's something that people are always shocked to learn. Um, so it makes my job very interesting. Though. Well, I was going to say, I know our, our secretary said the same thing, and I, and I hear it where somebody says, well, I got arrested in Covington. Can you, you know, help me? It's like, well, yeah, well, this is King County, right? Well, yes, but that's, that's yeah. you know, Covington. It, it's, um, you know, it gets weird. a little tricky. Yeah. <laughs> People get upset. 
also when they when you don't have the answers you can't help them so we try i try not to pass the buck i try to help them and then this last slide is just the photos of uh king county's police chiefs uh for the last hundred years and our our current chief spike jones uh, you may know from covington he was covington's chief uh, before ours um and that unless you have anything else i mean that's kind of the the quick uh, synopsis synopsis of 100 100 years um of two police departments i mean i think each police department could probably be its whole own uh yeah. yeah, lots of similarities and some differences, but more similarities, I think, than anything. It's interesting that yeah. they seem to follow very similar mm -hmm. paths. But, yeah. but I'm going to hand it back to uh, Berenger Crawford here. And yeah, so um, thank you guys for that great presentation. Um, I guess we'll start with going over the trivia question um, and to remind everyone that question was, when was the radio tower used for dispatch at the Campbell County Police Department dismantled? Um, the answer was um, in January of 2020, and we did have a winner, um, Todd Schutter, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, you did, congratulations for getting that correct with your answer of 2020. Um, we will be sure to get you your prize. Um, and we do have um, one question um, to go over. Um, it's uh, what is the ratio in Kenton County of women officers versus men currently? We're just talking about that. <laughs> uh, well, within Kent County Police Department, we currently have um, one female officer. Uh, that's Jill Stoltz, uh, who what's interesting is I mentioned that uh, Officer Haynes was involved with a lot of the female uh, women's policing and was a part of the national organization. Uh, well, Officer Stoltz is actually the president of Kentucky's uh, Women's Association uh, Law Enforcement, um, but she is the only one we have right now. Uh, so hopefully that ratio will, will improve moving forward. Now within King County as a whole, uh, I would say with, you know, you include the city agencies, there, there are a lot of, of women in policing in the county as a whole, uh, but not not as much with our agency. Um, we did have a question just come in on Facebook. Um, so if a citizen wanted to know how complaints of police misconduct are handled, can you suggest where to find out? Well, we, we both have, you probably have your own policy. Our Each department probably has their own policy. Um, and our policy states that you just come to the police department, ask to speak to command staff, and it's a written complaint and then it's followed through through the chain of command that way. But yeah, we do ask that they come in in person and do it in writing. Yeah, to some extent, how each department handles that will vary based on the size and, and availability of, of their resources. Uh, but I think any police department, if you have a complaint, you go in. Um, our policy is um, we, we investigate every complaint, even if you don't make a written complaint. Uh, the big difference is if you make a written complaint and you sign it, uh, that gives us a little more, uh, let's say, meat on the bones for the investigation. If you're not willing to sign it and you don't want to make a verbal complaint, uh, it limits a little bit of what we can use as far as what you say and, and kind of the proceedings of discipline. Um, but regardless of, of how it comes in, we, we look into every complaint. Yeah, same with Campbell County. I mean, you can call me up on the phone and start your complaint process that way, and it's still going to be looked into, you know, exactly the same way. Um, and we did have uh, many comments um, commenting on your guys' presentation. Richard Vox said that you could have had a couple of hours to cover this subject, and it was really interesting and well done. So thank you, guys. Um, other than that, I think we'll go into our reminders. So we would like to remind everyone that tomorrow night we have Amy London performing at Music at BCM um, as part of our concert series. So our doors will open at six and the show runs nice. from seven to nine. It's great fun for the whole family. So we hope to see you all there. Um, and we will continue to have those concerts through um, towards the end of August, every Thursday. We also have our great exhibit on Harlan Hubbard. So please be sure to check that out. For more Northern Kentucky history throughout the week, you can check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel where you can find the latest installments of our curator shot with our curator of collections, Jason French. Please like and subscribe on those. Um, and somebody just asked if masks are required for the concerts. They are outdoors and they are not. We also do not currently require masks indoors at the museum. So no, they are not required. Um, so 
that's all we have time for this evening. Thank you again to all of the sponsors and supporters of BCM. Our next um, Northern Kentucky History Hour will be on August 10th with Carl Litzenmayer on the Riverfront Floodwell, mur floodwell Murals. Until then, please take care, everyone, and good night. Thank you all.